All right, so far, this is what we've accomplished. I just showed you in the last video how you could take your, your line art and turn it into a vector. Whether it's an SVG vector file like this, or an EPS, which is my preferred format out of Illustrator. But the nice thing about an SVG is you can open up this file on a web browser and view it. And you can also view this file and manipulate it in vector.com, our freeware for vectors. This is out of Vector Magic. If we want to download this result, we have to pay for it. But you can download as an SVG, an EPS, or a PDF. So those are the two vector formats that are portable, SVG and EPS. PDF is just a way to show it electronically to a client, but it doesn't give you any kind of capability to use it for later purposes. So that's just for mockups. And they call it vectorizing. Illustrator calls it image tracing, but it's when you take raster images and turn them into a vector. So we've done that. This was it at 10 by 10 inches by 350 pixels per inch. Saved that as a JPEG, turned it into a vector. Now I'm going to open a new PhotoP file, brand new. I do not open the EPS in PhotoP. I do not drag the EPS. I'll show you. This is it. I'm going to mark it as purple. I do not drag this into PhotoP because if I do, it will open. But what it does is really complicated. <laughs> so what it does is create a ton of separate vector paths just like you have a vector file. And it does it at a default scale. Now the good news is, I actually like how this does it better than Photoshop. This brings in all of your different vector paths, but it brings it in at a scale as smart objects. So then you can go to uh, image, image size, and then change it to let's say 350 by 11 by 14. Or well, this would be, I guess, 11 by 15 something. And then it will match the resolution we need. But it's not one contained vector. It's not one contained line art. So instead of doing it that way, of dragging your EPS in to create your file, we're going to close this file in PhotoP, not save it, and we're going to say new project in PhotoP. And this is where we're going to put in our inches, just like we did for our logos, except instead of 8 by 10, we're making posters now, so we're going to make them a little bit bigger. 11 inches, this is just for coloring, by 14 inches. The next standard art size up from 8 by 10 is 11 by 14, by 350 pixels per inch. Create. Then we drag and drop the EPS onto that canvas. And we can size it. We can hold down Option and size it. It can be either an SVG or an EPS, though I like EPS better. And it will come in this way as a smart object that's not separated into each vector path. It's all together, which makes it a whole lot easier to color with. So I want you to make that large on the 11 by 14 because this is going to be your finished colored spot illustration. Then we set it up this way. We're going to rename your, your vector line art as black line art. And we're going to rename your blank white background as blank white <laughs> background. <laughs> okay. Then we're going to lock each of those layers with the padlock in PhotoP. So we can't accidentally mess with them. These are like the two pieces of bread that we're going to make our digital coloring sandwich with. And all the coloring we do, except for special effects at the end, are going to happen in between this piece of white bread and this piece of black bread. So I'm going to go to my bottom layer. And I'm going to click on the new layer, a little post-it. 
and I'm going to label my first layer of coloring, which is the most basic type, all in caps, flat local color. So this is a point where we need to save our work. And we're going to save it as a PSD. And I'm going to save it with my name and my semester code. And this is a Simon 5 color spot illustration, not just the line art. And I'm going to save it to the desktop. I'm going to verify that it's there. Here it's coming in, it's coming in. There it is. I'm going to mark it as green. And then each time I re-update re that, that green will go away, but I know it's saving. Okay, so now we're going to go into the class. And Olivia, this is what I want you to do to look at. So those of you who are ahead and already started coloring, I want you to go to the class. And I want you to go up to the assignments page from the home page. This is where I put extra resources for you. So under assignments, you know, unit modules is where you go through the whole project. You see the background information, instructor and past student examples, links to the YouTubes, all that stuff, full directions. Under assignments is our shortcuts to where we post these things. But it's also where I'll give you extra resources. And those extra resources were a little light in the first half of the class, like professional examples of certain things like compositing creature design. As we get into the second part of the class, we get more resources <laughs> because there's so many different ways we can approach something. This is not required course content. This is uh, like a textbook that's made available for you for this course content. So it's enrichment content. But the ones that say exhaustive, these are my pet projects. These are slides I put together to really explain things to you. So though all you're required to do is to do clean line art, a sketch of a spot illustration, clean line art, and then digitally color behind that line art in some way. Here I'm going to show you all the options for it. That's actually the mentorship presentation. So there's a few. There's a mentorship one, which was done by a digital honor student on digital inking. That was this morning, but that's using Adobe Illustrator. There's one that's on digital coloring, which is really helpful. From a student's point of view, it kind of simplifies it and shows what they were able to do with their character designs as a digital honor student. These steps, showing artists they like. And then there's mine which uses artists I like, like Bryce Coe from um, Pasadena in California, who makes her living doing posters and selling prints. But this is her process. So this is the clean line art. This is the flat color. This is the final color. Okay, And you're going to understand all of those as we go through this. So. This artist is obviously influenced by animation, right? The kind of line art and coloring you see in animation, which is called hard edge duotone, or another term for an animation, animation is called cell shading, because each of these animation cells used to be hand, hand painted. And that's why it looks the way it looks, but it's a whole aesthetic now. This is my process generally, and it varies for different projects. And I actually have a printout of this, you know, right on the stool in the middle of the room if you want to refer to it. But once you have your clean line art, the next step is flat local color. That's the thing I set up in PhotoP. Flat local color. What is flat local color? <laughs> so let's look at it here on this mentorship. Flat color means that each thing that is a thing, like the jacket versus the hat, versus the skin is one flat color. This even cheats a little bit because it looks better to give them rosy cheeks, but rosy cheeks are not flat color. So what I like to use is what I grew up with, like old Sunday comics. So if we look at Charlie Brown, this is what I used in the morning, it seemed to work. We look at images of Charlie Brown. The classic Charlie Brown 
which was only colored in the Sunday edition of the comics in Peanuts. This Charlie Brown is an example of digital coloring with just local flat color. So flat color is when it's one type of pixel, one color of pixel that fills in the entirety of a shape. It's sitting behind the black lines, like stained glass, if it's like a single color of glass. Black is not a color. White is not a color. So why is it local color? Local color means that you choose that flat color based on what the thing is, right? So a banana would be yellow. Charlie Brown is, is whiter than I am, right? So he's got this kind of nice Caucasian flat color. Charlie Brown wears a yellow shirt. Doesn't matter if it's noon with bright sun or if it's sunset. His shirt is just as bright yellow. That's flat local color, right? His shoes are brown, always brown. Now, newer versions of Charlie Brown look different. And you'll notice around this newer version, there isn't any outline. So because there's no outline, I lost it. Way to go. Open image in new tab. Because there's no outline around him, this would actually not be considered digital coloring. Because digital coloring is when you color behind a real or implied outline. But let's pretend for a moment that there is an outline around it and this is just the coloring, right? Because you definitely have an outline for the mouth. This is what's called full spectrum color. Because here the skin is like very yellowish. Here it's very pinkish. Here it's almost purplish, right? And yet it's a pretty similar portrayal, right? It's just a lot more variation within the color itself. Notice the shirt. The shirt's still yellow, but this yellow has browns in it. But unlike the skin, which has rosy cheeks and pinks and yellows, the shirt only has yellows. It has the difference between bright yellows and dark yellows. This is what we call duotone color, not full spectrum, because duotone is when you take one color and you separate it out into lighter and darker versions of that same color. That's the difference between hue and value and color theory. So here we have dark yellows and here we have light yellows. Just think of it as lights and shadows as variations on the yellow. But notice this does not look like anime or old cell animation, like Disney animation. This is what's called soft edge duotone because it gradates from the light to the dark. Same thing on the shoes. On the shoes, it's almost too soft. So they look like these kind of wet turds that he's wearing on his feet instead of having like a lot of solidity. So there's uh, pluses and minuses to these different approaches. So if we go to my slides in this exhaustive introduction to digital coloring, here with my Nico example, I demonstrate soft edge du duotone. It's basically what that 3D Charlie Brown would look like with an outline. And that's just done by creating highlights and then shadows and then softening the edge. And then eventually doing little special effects where I change the color of the outline to brown and I put little highlights on the helmet and on the claws on top of the black line art. So that's like the olive in the toothpick on the top of the sandwich. But everything else fits between the, the black line art layer and the white background. So that's that was my finished design for this. This is what's called duotone soft edged. But what if I like this approach? More like comic books and anime where it's duotone hard edge or cut edge or cell shading. That's where you're splitting each local flat color. I use Wonder Woman a lot because it's easy to show the primary colors there. This is local flat color for Wonder Woman, right? This is local flat color for Wonder Woman. Black and white are not colors. So you can add black to the, to the shield, make it look dimensional without adding it to the coloring. You can add white, add it to the coloring but it's not changing the color. It's still local flat color. What's interesting about all of these, some of them are current, some of them are old.